हेलो गाइज आई एम सिद्धार्थ आई लव शेयरिंग एंड एन्जॉय क्रिएटिंग कॉन्टेंट अबाउट इन्फॉर्मेशन अराउंड मशीन लर्निंग डेटा साइंस एंड वुड लव टू शेयर माई लर्निंग्स इन दिस जर्नी सो फार आई एम नॉट हेयर टू इंडोर्स एनी प्रोडक्ट सो टू स्पीक दे आर न्यूमरस प्रोडक्ट्स आउट देर इन दी मार्केट इट्स जस्ट माई एक्सपेरिमेंट्स इन दी प्रोडक्शन वर्ल्ड इको सिस्टम एंड हाउ आई नेविगेटेड दोज फर्दर ऑफ um so to give a little background about me uh, you have already shared a good introduction uh, i'm not going to uh, walk you through uh, my profile but uh, here are some sneak peeks you can uh, have a guesstimate around the same and uh, yeah um to begin with what i want to i've seen like uh, why i'm talking about this because i've seen both the sides of the ecosystem as a consultant as a developer as uh, being an academia person um the the problem that typically comes to us when we are in uh, the consulting domain is that hey we have this data um can you build us a model and send it back to us and then we take it further or when we are in academia then it's mostly about building models uh, define an approach and then you could evaluate certain stand uh, evaluate things on certain common benchmarks like image nets etc and then publish this right uh, but the common underlying thing that uh, surfaces in both the worlds is that it's not done after we ship right so what i mean by that is the story doesn't end here building a model and putting it into production is not the be all and end all of things likewise publishing a particular research is also not not the be all and end all uh, you would need to monitor things how the impact of your work the impact of your model is actually happening into production systems and that has serious repercussions on not only just the uh, accuracy metrics or the user experience so to speak for the app that you have been developing but also even long term societal impacts that could be drawing further in from there uh like amazon had back then early on uh, released a model which was unfair it uh, had deployed a uh, it was very popular in the news in 2015 16 uh the model was biased towards discriminating features from the female gender the resumes were not getting shortlisted and that immediately shut down the model so if it were monitored that well if it was tested that well against standard benchmarks the need would not have arisen right likewise even in our day to day lives right uh, the discrimination the advancements in ai have happened so far so much that we need to be very cautious about what we are shipping and it doesn't just don't only impacts uh, the business revenue metric so far but also has even uh, how the market changes or uh, even so to speak the society uh, gets addressed with the uh, things that they'll be using in further um, so just a quick refresher most of you would be from the ml realm but uh, a very very quick recap recap on what a uh, machine learning function would be doing you have a set of uh, input data and <coughs> the machine learning model is trying to understand the function that can map the input to the right output and this relationship determination is what the model is actually trying to learn so in a nutshell model is trying to be a function of the data and that is what is trying to learn uh now talking about the main thing like so the talk is not only about what can go wrong i'll give you numerous examples of what i have seen going wrong but the rest of the slides will mostly be about what are the things that you should be monitoring and uh, how do you monitor those things so the f- couple of examples that i've seen in my journey happens to be like uh, the world changes and your training data has no clue about what the real world may be right suddenly in computer vision models right uh when covid came in your lock screen uh detection algorithms did not know how to see uh your faces with masks right so that was a very classic example that has been there in toxins uh, uh, numerous times 
very practical example because that is a paradigm shift that happened in the world. People were not using masks that often, so nor were the systems designed in such a way. And hence, if there are such paradigm shifts, these changes won't happen very and uh, like periodically or at a very fast frequency, but they would happen, and that is the time when your models could go haywire. Likewise, your model inputs could change. So some other developer uh, in your team is developing a particular model and, or a data pipeline and from there you are and the person is uh, giving data into the database and you are using that data uh, to train your models. So there is communication gap because he is the producer of the, the feature and you are the consumer of the feature. He doesn't know that, that you might be using this particular feature in your particular model development or training. And this is a common bottleneck that uh, has been seen, which could blow out model uh, accuracies in uh, out of proportion. And of course, there could be unintended bugs, things that you never even dreamt of thinking about, missing values, null values. They are handled well, but a sudden surge or spike, let's say a particular feature, let's say Apple introduced a new policy in uh, the Artec ecosystem in terms of uh, not sending in device information or not sending in user information. You have this feature, right? Everyone who uses app uh, asks apps not to tra not to track, right? So suddenly, when they introduce this feature, and you and your team were not aware that okay, this feature that I always used to know that okay, I would know the location of when the person is browsing from Nimhans, Bangalore, or somewhere else. Uh, is not gonna be coming in your request so the model will never be if and the model had a high feature importance for let's say location as a feature your model will suddenly start going uh, haywire so that is something that one needs to be super cautious about likewise uh, another key thing that I've seen is yeah models try to influence the world they are in uh, so um, for so to speak, uh, the example that I wanted to give here is you have deployed already a model and there are numerous other players, other competitors who are also in a competitive landscape in a similar world. For example, in bidding ecosystem, if your model is trying to change the world based on the bidding patterns your interest, uh, your particular model development cycle is, it may have an effect on the entire market as well. Because your deployment strategies or your model building strategy might uh, have certain issues which makes every bid to be a little more pricier and that's where you are winning a lot more auctions and eventually the rest of the market thinks that the entire market has shifted towards more pricey things but that's not the case it's just that some particular uh, platform started bidding more aggressively and it was left unmonitored and that's why uh, the other market is losing and it's not just about losing it it's just that they also have to adopt adapt this and uh, this is the societal change that also comes to being that the market scenario shifts if your models also uh, go wrong and go under deterministic and yeah uh, so to speak uh, the models if left unmonitored also can decay over time uh, numerous features are uh, gonna be shifting in, in priority, like I've seen a particular feature that was working in uh, our particular uh, pipelines for three and a half years suddenly became the least relevant or important feature. And if such features still can, if you don't reiterate or retrain your models time and again with the uh, changing needs of the market, then the model performance decay is bound to happen. So is it that models are just a liability after shipping? Uh, is it only fun that okay during the development stage uh, when you're using your Keras or TensorFlow notebooks that is the fun part and you just get to do uh, all the research development around the product building life cycle etc or is it that uh, and is it possible that post the release of all of this things go very heavy things go very uh, iffy that okay I don't want to monitor all of this this is very ops uh, kind of work and uh, people typically tend to neglect that, which should not be the case, and that's what I want to highlight. Models are not actually a liability after shipping because you actually get to learn the major nuances about your models functioning in production, in real world scenarios. So 
data sets that you would have held you would have had golden data sets training data set hold out validation everything that you would have done would have been a point in time reference and uh, they may not that particular thing will not represent everything in the ideal world that will be that your model will be looking at in the next 3 to 6 months or even in its life cycle if uh, even if it is like a one time trained or built model so um, a very particular example uh, that i would suggest here is active learning has gained a lot of attention not only just in uh, computer vision but also llms the research is going gonna go towards using active learning because with active learning you can reduce a lot of data needs i'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next slide uh, but before that let's le uh, learn a little bit about what online learning is and then contrast it with how Uh, active learning happens to be, and active learning also happened to uh, find reference in Amazon's shareholder letters. So they wanted to reduce their data needs by about 40x, and it uh, did culminate in a good, significant reduction as well. Um, so first, let's go through what online learning is. So your data flow, data streams continually keep coming in, and they. Uh, help you retrain your model time and again you have the baseline model you either retrain it from on a rolling window cycle or you could uh, actually have that particular model as the baseline uh, with the weights initialized and whatever new data comes in let's say new one hour of data or new one day of data you can retrain the model with that depending on your model size model uh, training times etc so this actually happens to be good if you have uh a good stream of ground truth also coming in so in our cases uh, in adtech we also get whether this ad that we showed ended up in a click or did it get served as an impression did we win the auction did it end up in an install or did a user take any action on that but if there are cases when ground truth ground truth data is scarce you need to have labeled data sets around the same and that's where online learning becomes a lot more cumbersome because training and labeling this data becomes an expensive affair uh, and there are ways we can mitigate that uh, and this also has a particular challenge that this needs to uh, this needs a good amount of monitoring right in terms of the data that is coming in the new pipelines that are coming in and it requires like you have continuous integration and continuous development uh, continuous deployment so likewise you have to have continuous monitoring as well and monitoring that at a much faster much uh, longer like much faster frequency could be daunting unless it is automated because your qas etc won't be looking in every time a new model goes out live let's say if your model update frequency is 12 times a day uh, no one has that bandwidth so people would want to learn uh, this in an automated way so that's why there is a shift uh, depending on the use case depending on the type of data online learning actually happens to solve a good amount of problems but there are ways where this can this monitoring needs can be uh, diminished um and yeah of course as i said that because if you have to train also let's say dedicatedly if two hours you you might also end up evaluating or testing that again some benchmark thing uh, again for another 15 minutes so it requires dedicated hardware so that before you ship it uh, out into production you have it well sanitized and well tested thoroughly so it becomes a cost uh, intensive affair uh, and then comes in sorry the side part is a little cut uh, that says label data um, so this is the active learning loop uh, that i was talking about um so this starts in a little differently that you don't necessarily need that okay all the data i have i need to have it labeled and then i i'm going to start doing and uh, going to uh, train about it i can start with start making predictions with whatever data that i have and then i can do um i can pull in further unlabeled data samples start labeling that because the decision boundary that your model might have right would ha i'll pull in mostly the low confidence uh, examples i would not want to pull in in uh, like let's say you are you having a cats versus dogs classifier so uh, let's say pugs and 
golden retriever those will be very far off separated in the machine learning models because they have very distinct characteristics of seg uh, segregation but other examples where they are of very similar type the decision the points will be the data points will be very close to the decision boundary and hence um, we would mostly pull in the examples where we are uh, and you all know that uh, wherever the if both the examples in different classes are very near to the decision boundary the model will be less confident because it will not know that okay this might be this or this could also be this other thing and that's how softmax also applies this this function to the rendering so uh, active learning loop assumes the fact that okay there will be cases where you will have lesser confidence on things and you might not end up uh, in the best possible approach so this completes this like active learning does have monitoring ingrained in its uh, core essence of the training cycle itself so it always keeps on pulling examples wherein uh, things you are less confident about you take in those examples retrain it and then push it further so this is a the concept that I w uh, would love to advocate about. This is something you can uh, check out in your independent use cases on how these uh, come to being. Um, these are things that I just talked about. Um, yeah, comes in the idea of uh, model monitoring and how actually is it different from uh, ops monitoring. So people might think that um, the behavior that we are trying to uh, capture or monitor is gonna be very simple or easy but it's actually not like in DevOps monitoring the things that you are uh, gonna catch or gonna be looking at are very standardized whether my uh, res uh, request response time is under 3 milliseconds or 3 seconds my website is loading in under this particular uh, amount of time or I have errors in my uh, application right uh, or I have errors in my home screen or when the user is actually interacting. So these are very standard things that, that can be written down and can be tested manually by the QA team or automatically. But uh, model monitoring because the data in itself is coming from different sources, likewise the annotation could be happening from different third parties, mechanical turkers, etc. So uh, the, mo the model itself is an approximation, we uh, talked in ML 101 that y is equal to fx model is actually an approximation of the data that you are throwing it in. So it is trying to understand that. So it actually is more randomized, more stochastic in nature and is less deterministic and that makes the problem even more harder uh, to monitor what we actually are going to be monitoring. So you have data on one axis, you have the annotations or the features on another axis, you have time as another component. Even if it is not a time series problem, you'll still be monitoring how that data has been versioned over time. And this will not necessarily be the case in DevOps monitoring. You just need to monitor at point in time of reference or a particular commit you are going to be monitoring. Uh, so the also this other point that model monitoring can be uh, very user driven. So if suddenly people started clicking lot more pug pictures than their own selfies or uh, their mirror fees started coming in like in 2012-13 than their own individual self pictures so uh, that could also change in uh, a lot of what your model is actually trying to look at so it's really not the same as devops monitoring and it's not that simple i'm not saying it's a very hard nut to crack uh, there are use cases where people have built in uh, a lot of example scenarios uh, there are a lot of products out on uh, out there i'll name a few for you you can look at it in your convenience and probably try to integrate that um, but the key things that you are actually going to be monitoring are A. Data. Data is the oil with which machine learning sails its boat. Features are derived from this data. Now this can be uh, derived synthetically or with certain scripts or they are actually data they, that has been composed to build features and eventually also models uh, that you are uh, tackling to build. And typically we have seen that uh, the performance degrades over time and that is what we want to avoid and uh, of course it might happen but we want to be alarmed at least that my model's performance is actually uh, going to decay and I might not want to continue using this particular model in production. So uh, data issues can actually have a cascade of uh, effects. So if there are a lot and many null values, missing values, new values, even if it's in a tabular data or if it is audio waves, you are starting to hear more animal sounds than human sounds in videos. 
this may actually result in giving you a particular different uh, model accuracy. And model accuracy is something that data scientists typically try to monitor during the staging environment or how during A-B tests uh, things work. But this should also always be uh, treated like a holy sanctity process that if your model is already live in production, every new iteration of the model that is going out or if it is against, if it is a one-time deployment and you have a holdout data set, every time a new data set comes in, you hold out a particular data and if you have ground roots, even better, you'll be able to determine what the model accuracy will be and this will serve as a very good threshold or a benchmark for you to know whether a new model that went out is actually performing well or not. Uh, then, monitor, like as in, as I talked about, uh, monitoring in machine learning will have a couple of components. Inputs is one particular part and this is the easier problem to solve because it is similar to what we have been uh, used to hearing or knowing about what we want to monitor in DevOps processes. So these are very classic statistics uh, you would typically like to monitor about. This is this I'm talking about data, but you could also uh, check in about your model, APIs, endpoints, uh, related information. Is uh, the distribution of my data looking very significant? This is deterministic. Like I know what I'm looking out for here, right? Uh, in other cases, like the output is something that I'm not super sure of because that is user behavior or intent driven. Input, I have seen things are gonna change over time. That that is a separate story. But I know this is a little more. I'm not saying it's a solved problem, but it is a lot more standardized. I can write it down in steps based on different domains as well, what I actually intend to monitor. If it's a vision problem, I would love to monitor whether uh, the documents that are coming in, are they uh, having good DPI resolution or not? Are they well scanned or not? Or is it that people just uh, tend to have shitty cameras and not everyone is a, 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 an iPhone user? So this is something that uh, people can actually monitor in terms of inputs. In terms of outputs, there can be numerous other things. They could be uh, hard, like the concept itself could change. Humans wearing masks was not uh, super common, except of course in Japan. They were uh, pretty hygienic even earlier on in 2009 when I went there. Uh, you, yeah, confidence is something that I was actually talking about even in active learning case. This is a classic example. Highest probably, like the places your model is super confident about, which are far off in the decision boundaries, you don't need to actually worry about them uh, for a good amount of a considerable period of time. Whatever is actually in the least confidence intervals, that is something that you should uh, typically continue to monitor and those should be your uh, part of your validation or holdout data set. And uh, if you have ground truth, much, much better. Or if you can obtain, if, you are, uh, pr if the problem that you are trying to solve, for example, in our case, uh, we do tend to uh, get install or post back data from ad exchanges uh, at Kaizen. So we do have separate data set where we can okay, actually test whether the model is actually good or not. But example for uh, Google Lens, it actually may not be very difficult, it may become very difficult to see whether what you, uh, whether what a person clicked and the results that you actually showed him, whether he liked those results or not, because every time you cannot ask the user, uh, did the five images that first showed you, were, were shown to you, were actually relevant to what you were wanting to search from the Lens uh, application. So, as much as possible, uh, even if it, if even if the uh, ground truth comes in delayed, like comes in within one hour, two hours or a month, you still have something to learn from. The problem becomes even harder when there is no ground truth coming in and that's uh, where actually self-labeling this data set comes in very handy and establishing this should be uh, like the onus of data science teams themselves and actually data scientists don't want to do that because we feel that is it really my job to actually hand label this data but trust me, like if uh, the team is uh, forward thinking enough and they can understand the value of a golden data set, so to speak, then mechanical turkers who you would have to actually train and uh, if the data science team actually has the onus of uh, training the model pipeline and uh, maintaining and see, overlooking the entire developmental process, then they'll be much better suited at, at this uh, uh, in this journey. So 
uh, actually even ground truth labeling is not even that big of a uh, problem but if it it is more like a ui ux problem so an example that i'll give is is from a, a tool called as prodigy and uh, if you simulate the same experience on mechanical turk you'll have to first give the rationales of what you are actually expecting and your labels you might also end up doing another round of sanity checking on what the turkers would have produced but in such cases when the data scientists have already seen that okay i have seen a, this is a text example but in other cases i would have seen data which did not have a lot of filters and suddenly uh, people uh, snapchat introduced filters or instagram uh, introduced a lot of filters and lot of the uh, data that we are getting is actually filtered it might actually deviate the model uh, than it was uh, working as before and uh, if you think at the heart of it monitoring is less of a, a developmental problem but more like likewise annotation that i was talking about like ground to establishment monitoring is also a ux problem so if someone uh, let's say uh, there happened to be a deployment in the evening and uh, the model went berserk and your team got notified of an alarm that the kl divergence is 1.5 who in the audience will be able to make sense out of it that okay there is something wrong out of it or if you go and tell to your cto hey uh, we need to uh, turn down all our production servers saying that kl divergence is 1.5 you'll get a no like why what is kl divergence he wouldn't understand that right so you have to make things a little more easier to understand and uh, like devops people may not have data science fundamentals as well so devops may be the first responders to your models health degradation so eventually they would need to be able to understand this uh, the alerts that you are throwing to them in a much easier to understand way and class uh, another an example that i can give you is a distribution uh, so okay i missed out on the fact that orange is the training data the graphs the stacks representing the black ones are things that you are seeing in production um so if you suddenly started to see a lot more pug examples and if this app happens to be a problem in your production environment how are you gonna uh, give an alert would you choose option 1 wherever the alert goes whether it's a teams or slack or your whatsapp whatever integrations you do but in the middle of the night at 1:30 if you get a message like that how will you be able to make a decision that I, whether i have to shut down the model or revert back to a previous version or not or is it actually a problem or really uh, not a problem so another second an alternate version could be that the output distribution like K, what does actually kl uh, divergence does is show you the difference between how the output distribution was and what it was with the input distribution or you could actually dummy it down even further to what the data was showing the talk before uh, the uh, the girl was talking about how storytelling works with data right so you had the similar previous data and you just had to inform that okay hey we are seeing a lot more number of bugs this is something that your technical like uh, the person in the domain uh, even your devops person might be able to understand if you have if you show this graph and this particular problem and you might be able to still say that okay this, this doesn't seem that might that big of a problem to me because this is the output that is coming to us now whether that comes as a feedback to the uh, production training pipelines or not that is data scientists call but it may not necessarily be a use case where you have to shut down your production model training pipelines or shut down your uh, systems that are in place uh, from long um another important factor when looking at monitoring or uh, yeah uh, observability so to speak is who actually happens to be making the decision on which ground like these are questions one needs to ask in any domain regardless of the problem that you are in uh, these are some questions that you could be asking yourselves like why am i making such a decision what is the basis on which i want to be taking the decision and why like as in uh, why is this a decision like that need uh, made by the model so you might want to understand whether to give a scholarship to a person or not if that is also automated by certain ai models uh, it is a cause of concern because it's only about the textual modality and it may not necessarily be checking into the or probing into the other documents so uh, 
or anything about whether adoption may be legal or not. If these are uh, also certain things that AI models are gonna uh, advocate in the future, then uh, they also have to be explainable that why I'm, is my model making a prediction like so and so. Um, a few more slides before I go. Uh, so, you have certain small, imp like, uh, so I call like as in these are diagrams which these are bubbles on this particular graph which represent things that people care about in a particular organization. So the data science teams, uh, the data scientists would mostly be looking at your model's accuracy. Uh, your product team will be looking at something even further like click through rate, CPIs, etc. Uh, that is uh, part of the user behavior. It's uh, lesser impact but uh, also little easier to monitor. But your CEO might also be looking at business metrics, like what, whatever your team is doing, he might be interested in what revenue is that particular thing making, right? And at last, what could happen to be is uh, what models you are producing, how are they changing or affecting the society at large? Is it changing the narrative of the bid land ecosystem altogether or not? Uh, is it deviating the world into a very biased, raci racist, prejudiced world? Uh, so those are things which are very hard to monitor and I would love to uh, hear if anyone has certain ideas around the same. I uh, happen to don't know how these are uh, solved things. So those are having a large impact on the society at large and are even harder to monitor. So if uh, I'll be happy to have a discussion on the same. Uh, but people are with LLM's advancement in the last uh, few years, these are actually going to have a lot more meaning in uh, how we talk about processes. Uh, I really talked about this. These are time delayed because the repercussions of these uh, factors could also show up uh, at a later point in time. And uh, you like as in let your users give you feedback around how the model is actually behaving. I'm not talking about ground truth here. Uh, ground truth is one particular part of the journey. It could come in from the user. It could come in as a post back. It could come in from third parties. But uh, more like whether your whether your user is actually satisfied with the outcomes of your model is something that you should also be looking at that could also help you drive whether your revenue is going to get whether you're going to get get in more bucks in uh, for your campaigns or you're going to get more funding you have your stakeholder buy in in place um la Lastly, I typically like to say that DS team should own the whole process. It should not be let uh, alone for uh, that, hey, I don't want to do this or that, like annotation is not my job or monitoring is not my job. Of course, the team's responsibility should uh, happen to be in the place. And this is something that I borrowed from Amazon. Uh, they have started giving in well-architected frameworks for a lot of uh, research processes as well, not only just development that they, like they used to do like a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, mm, where this shows primarily that monitoring should be a key component of it. Likewise, identifying the business goal, of course, that is a onus of both the product and data science team. But uh, the loop gets closed only if uh, your mo model is getting monitored and it is not left for it uh, like a fish to rot out. Um, so there are, uh, so this is an example that I uh, put in uh, from SageMaker as well. Uh, this architecture shows in a typical uh, example wherein you have your typical SageMaker training jobs and you have your model pipeline ready. This is a, the part below is something that you can also add to your pipelines. It's very simple. There are commercial off the shelf tools as well. I can name like uh, Arise is there in the market, Aporia, Fiddler, Sensius. Supervise, Neptune, numerous uh, platforms are out there, evidently amongst the open source ones. Um, but it's not that b difficult, like if your model training pipeline is, is simpler, uh, it's not actually that b big of a deal to add a scheduler based job that can actually help monitor your input and output distributions. You can set it up on your Airflow or your any of your schedulers. If you're working in Java, you could set it up on Quads. and it's all it is talking about is monitor your input and output uh, and you are more or less sorted. These are standard metrics your data scientists know of. If you are just able to get your teams to work uh, more closely together, uh, a DevOps team person can set up a scheduler, the data scientist can tell in which metrics we are going to monitor and uh, it's not that big of a hassle anymore. 
um so yeah thank you that's my time